Good morning, everyone. Good morning. good morning. It is so good to be here and to see your masked faces so we can be safe while we sing with each other and to know that I will, we will, you know, be, have joy in singing and also in meeting in our fellowship hour afterwards where people who want to can discard their masks and take them off. So thank you for being here. Thank you to everyone who joins us later on YouTube. We really treasure having an online audience, whether you are members of the church or hangers on, we love having you watch our service and hope that it's helpful to you. Let us know if it is. You all know, I know everyone who is sitting here knows that whoever you are, you are welcome here because of who you are in all the particularities of your life's journey. And that is true to those who watch us on YouTube as well. Open, Open the gates, gates for on the side of Jerusalem, a grand parade of Rome brings the pomp and circumstance of power and prestige to the streets for the Passover feast. Open the gates for on the other side of Jerusalem, a humble procession enters the city among the lives of the Jewish poor and marginalized. Entering through the gates, we ride in on horses with the powerful armor of Rome. Bind the festal procession with power. Let the feast begin. Entering through the gates, Jesus comes riding on a donkey and proud by laying down the palm branches and shouting, Hosanna. Open to us the gates of God, and together we will claim, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Sometimes we can enter into the 
circumstances of our lives, we hear of others arrogance or lack of awareness of the needs of our neighbor. Forgive us for being more interested in our own achievements or our obsession with seeking the approval of others. Come to save us now. Transform us into a people of humility and righteousness, we pray. Amen. The good news of God this day is this. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. For on this day, God has entered into our lives with love and compassion for all who surrender and lay down their lives in Christ. Friends, you are love. You are embraced. You are forgiven. Amen. We give thanks, thanks to the Lord. For God, God is good, and, and God's, God's love endures forever. Amen and amen. 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 scripture reading. This can be from Psalm 118, 1 through 2, and 19 through 29. Oh, give, give thanks, thanks to the Holy One, one for God, God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Holy One. This, this is the gate, gate of the Holy One. One. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Holy One's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Holy One has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Holy One. O Holy One, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Holy One. We bless you from the house of the Holy One. The Holy One is God, and he has given us light. By the righteous righteous and the horns of the of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. I will give thanks to the Holy One, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Our Gospel reading this morning is from Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, 
and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on the cloaks. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. God. Please pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, O oh good and gracious Holy One, be acceptable to your sight and lead us ever closer to understanding of you and of our place in this world as your disciples. We pray in Jesus' name and your name. Amen. Amen. So it's kind of laid out in the liturgy, isn't it? The psalm, one of the psalms from the Hebrew Bible that helps to set up why Jesus entered Jerusalem as Jesus did. And of course, there were prophecies from Isaiah as well, and Jeremiah and other of the uh, Hebrew Bible prophets, or the, I should say the prophets of the Jews who were recorded later and you know, adopted into the Hebrew scriptures. And those are the scriptures that Matthew is referring to when he says, you know, a number of them. This was to fulfill the scriptures that Jesus sent his disciples to find a donkey with a foal, a young donkey that had, in one of the other scriptures, it says one that had never been ridden before. And that was part of one of the prophecies. And as many of us know, the author of Matthew was very concerned with tying Jesus, everything that Jesus did and that happened to Jesus, tying that to the prophecies in the scriptures of the Hebrew people, the Jews. And then more of the backstory is necessary understand what was happening and why this was such an important occasion that it came to be an important time for the Christian church to commemorate. Part of that backstory is what we tried to reenact at the very beginning of the service. There were actually two processions entering Jerusalem at or around that time. <clears throat> One of them came every single year <clears throat> because the people of Judah, which is where Jerusalem is located, were subservient to the power of Rome. And as Passover approached each year, pilgrims, Jewish pilgrims, from all of the diaspora that existed even then, although not quite as widely as it is now, pilgrims from all of the Jewish diaspora would come to Jerusalem, the holy city, the city of Zion, as 
Uh, David called it to pack, be there for the Passover, which was the holiest of celebrations for the Jewish people. And Rome was always nervous about crowds of the people over whom it ruled, because Rome wasn't simply ruling benevolently. Rome, like every other top ruler in any domination society, which has been the normal kind of societal structure throughout the ages, wanted to make sure that the people knew who was dominant and remained subservient. So every year before the Passover began, Rome would send <clears throat> troops, Roman soldiers, on their fine, big, tall horses, powerful horses, with shields and spears and armor to intimidate the people and make sure that they knew their place and that nothing untoward happened during the Passover celebration when so many people were gathered there in Jerusalem to worship the God of the Jews. So that was going on. And that's what one side of our um, call to worship personified and gave voice to. The other side turned out to be a different, apparently, to those who were observing, but not to Jesus, an impromptu procession coming, we think, from the other side of the city, possibly at the same time. A procession that was not full of armor and steel and um, show or display of strength, but a procession that was led by a single man riding a young donkey. Now, how much more humble can you get than that? Donkeys were beasts that were considered fit for women and children to ride or the lowliest peasant. And of course, most of the people in Judah at that time were peasants. Sir, all of the ones who lived outside of Jerusalem or any other major city were peasants. Even if they were artisans, they were classified as peasants. Much as you see in, um, you know, we, we see the same thing in India. You have small, or in many, many, all over the world, in small villages, everyone there has the same social status pretty much regardless of what they actually do with their hands for a living. And it was Rome's policy to make sure that the peasants <clears throat> and the fruit of their work went up the food chain through the wealthy elites of the society who worked with Rome to keep everybody quiet, to keep any rebellions from happening up through those elites of local elites to Rome, so that ultimately Rome benefited from the work done by everyone else in these subject countries. That's, as I say, was the normal order of society everywhere in the world, and has been for many millennia, where a few at the top reap the benefits from the labor of the many. And as I mentioned, it's commonly called a domination system because its existence depends upon the denomination of the domination of the many by the few. That's the backstory and helps us understand why Jesus' procession was so different and looked at as so differently because of the contrast with the processions that Rome would put on. And another piece of this is that 
the Jewish rulers who were at this time the scribes and the priests of the temple because they had been asked by Rome to be the local rulers there in Jerusalem, they had in Rome's name prohibited all processions unless they were pre-approved by the Roman authorities or their, or their henchmen, I'll call them. And Jesus' procession could not have been approved. So the people who joined in Jesus' procession were really courting danger. They were acting in defiance of the domination system. And if we think about who, where Jesus came from, this small town of Nazareth, which was a town of peasants, including artisans like carpenters, but still all classed as peasants, people who lived off the land and who had to pay tribute both to the local governors, at that time the, the priests and scribes of the temple, as well as the Roman governor, at that time Pontius Pilate, but also on up the food chain to Rome. And the Jews had to collect those taxes on behalf of Rome. Again, an illustration of the domination system in existence at that time. Well, I want us to use this as a springboard, not just for the joy that is expressed in the waving of our palm branches, remembering the joy that was in the crowd as they felt like this is the fulfillment of our scriptures for the coming of the Messiah. Maybe Jesus is the Messiah, but also for the uneasiness that must have existed among some of the people who realized, I don't think Rome approved this procession. Should I take place or not? That was the setting. But it's not just about the past, is it? Because we have domination systems around the world today. And they're in the news. And there are ways in which our own society reflects that time, not time limited, from time immemorial of human existence, we suspect system of people who are stronger exploiting others, trying to dominate others. And we in our nation has tried hard to fight to make it a nation for everybody, but we still see elements of domination systems here in our own country. The Covenant School shooting is one example in the sense that while that shooter was individually perhaps trying to, to, to dominate, to scare, to, to have power over people that he distrusted, that he had a grievance against, but what about the people who made that massacre so easy by advocating the manufacture of weapons of mass destruction in our country by advocating that they be easy to acquire that and by passing legislation that made it easy to acquire or simply refusing to pass legislation that would make it have harder for people who had no business with weapons of mass destruction, owning them and having them at hand where they could use them when they wanted to if they were clever enough. That's one example from this last week. Another example from this last week was in a way commemorated by our transgender day of visibility. As I said to Lisa earlier, the first day 
or commemoration or honoring people who are transgender in the country was a transgender day of remembrance, which we have observed here in this church as long as I've been back in Nashville, and I'm sure before that. And that, that happens, I think, in June. Sometimes it's a different day in the year. But it's a day of remembrance of all those who have died simply because they were transgender. And why did they die? Because someone else thought they should not exist. Now, is that an impulse toward domination or not? But the Transgender Day of Visibility is to say, no, there's something positive about allowing people to express freely who they are, to express freely without fear of becoming a statistic for or someone who is mourned on the Day of Remembrance. That's another domination system. And it applies not just to those who are transgender, but all to all who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. I remember way back when Matthew, I forget his last name, was crucified on a fence out west. That was an attempt to dominate him and intimidate everyone else that was like Matthew, and that's an attempt at domination. And what about the laws prohibiting all abortions, even for the mother's life? That's domination of women's bodies, normally passed by legislatures that are mostly men. And I think, in fact, Every legislature in this country is mostly men, although the proportions differ. So that's domination. So we have bits of domination throughout our society. And that's what Jesus was writing the cult to say. I don't have to have guns. I don't have to have a spear and shield to be a vibrant and powerful force against this system because I come in the name of the kingdom of God where everyone is equal, everyone is loved, and no one dominates anyone else. And that is why we revere Jesus. That is why we worship the God who sent Jesus with this message a message that the whole world, from all of history, including this very moment, needs to hear in order to have real hope for the most of us. Please join me in prayer. Oh, gracious God, our hearts can grow heavy even on what we normally think of as a joyful day, when we think about all of the pieces of domination that occur in our own society and throughout the world. We ask for your guidance in discerning them, in figuring out how we can oppose them in ways that are compassionate and universal and effective. We pray in your name. Amen.
transition into our time for prayers of the congregation, I want to uh, share with you a message I received from John this morning. But he said he had received a note from Bo, Bo's son, was at school Monday when the shooting went down. Mm -hmm. Apparently at the Covenant School. To say we are in a fog is an understatement. It's a living nightmare. So John asked that we pray in support of Bo's son and entire family. And we also want to include, of course, all of the families that were affected by this shooting. I want to broaden the prayer to all of the families who've been affected by all of the school shootings in this country which are too numerous at this point to name. That's a heavy prayer, but it's one that is needed, I think, for our healing as well as for those family and all the others directly affected, because it does indirectly affect every single one of us in this country, one way or another. Please pray with me. Gracious God, our hearts are heavy, and we will pray for so many who need your comforting presence. But we are so grateful for all the things for which we can still give thanks, which bring joy to our lives. The beauty of this morning and of your world. Grandchildren, and children who invite us on trips, whether it's to Legoland or to Disney World, as is happening to another family in the congregation today. Thanksgiving for families, broader families that love us and that give to us in so many ways that we can't even count. Thanksgiving for friends who visit well into our 90s, like Julie, continues to be faithful to Norma. We also have gratitude that Angela's parents are doing well at the moment, that her father recovered against some great fears, and that they're keeping on, continuing to treasure their lives and to enjoy their lives with Angela's support and also that of their church community there in Alabama. We're so grateful to hear that kind of story. Because these positive stories give us strength and hope for those that are either not so positive or still haven't unfolded. Stories like Blake's, where we ask that he have a team that recognizes the risks, plans against them, is prepared against them, and that all goes well. And we wish the same for others with complicated surgeries, including Sophie, who has had far too many for her young life. Let her feel your healing presence through the faith of those around her. We also ask for your prayers for all those who are oppressed in some way in this world by gun violence that is perpetuated by a system of enablement of manufacturers, legislators, and people who don't understand or don't have enough compassion for others who are more likely to be the victims of shootings. We ask for your blessings for everyone who is transgender or queer in any way 
who is fearful for their own safety, or has been. <clears throat> May they feel the power of hope in this society and feel the power of compassion that exists in congregations like this for all of them. And we ask for better solutions for the women of childbearing age in this country, especially in states like Tennessee, where they have just had their own rights to determine their own best medical health taken away from them by people who cannot possibly understand what it means. We bring these prayers of gratitude and joy along with these prayers of, of sorrow, of need for assurance, of wanting to spread the sense of her <clears throat> healing power to all, all who are in need of it. We pray these things in your name and in the name of the one who taught us the prayer, which is in our bulletin. <laughs> our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Kindred, God is good, and God's steadfast love endures forever and ever. Because of God's enduring love, we cherish and give thanks for every good gift in our lives. Today, on this day that God has made, we come to share out of the abundance of God's love and light among us so that the world may know this boundless love that knows no end, no end. Would I see we have the... Um, <laughs> So here in the UCC, we have a table that is open to all, without exception. So come, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are righteous, but because you accept God's call to a more righteous life. Come not because you belong to a special club, but because you are one of God's own beloved. Come and be fed with God's holy food, 
that is not reserved for the few, but which is here for all who want strength for their journey. And we know that on the night when Jesus knew that he was facing the end, he gathers his disciples together. And during their meal, he broke bread, as was the custom, and he blessed it. And he gave it to them, saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he poured the wine. And again, as was the custom, he blessed the wine for all. But he said, and take this and drink. This is the wine of the new covenant in my blood that is given for you to partake. Gracious God, bless this bread and this juice, this fruit of the vine, that symbolizes the holy food that you want us to take in to our bodies and our spirits every single day. That symbolizes the history of the love that you have shown us through the life and the teachings of Jesus. Come with your spirit and sanctify them for our use and in us through our actions. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Please pray with me. Righteous one, it is not easy to follow your path. Your way requires intention and, at times, sacrifice. It requires distinguishing between those who are being dominated and those who are dominating or seeking to dominate. And it requires responding with love and compassion to all. Give us strength with this holy nourishment where we would follow your way, trusting that the Holy One will respond with joy and grace for every step that we take toward the kingdom. Amen. Amen. And now our sending hymn, All Glory, Lord, and Honor. Stand if you wish, or stand in body or spirit.
So, having entered through the gates and power and prestige, this Jesus has called us to go out in love, compassion, and humility. Having entered through the gates on donkeys and waving palms, this Jesus has come to save and now calls us to go out in hope, justice, and love. Together, we are embraced by an enduring and boundless love that forges us together in shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Friends, go forth only to serve the God whose love endures forever. Go forth in the name of Christ, who entered Jerusalem on a lowly donkey. Go forth in the strength of the Holy Spirit that calls us to rejoice in this very day that God has made. God's love endures forever. God's love endures forever. Amen. Amen.